Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. European leaders may well praise their continent's resilience when it comes to the energy crisis, but despite headline inflation slowly dropping and economic growth forecasts slightly improving, core inflation, which excludes energy and food prices, is likely to remain stubbornly high, leading experts are warning. That means that consumers are likely to continue to feel the cost of living pinch this year. Recently, concerns about the health of Europe's banks have added to the uncertainty. Well, to take a closer look at some of these problems, I'm joined by Irene Tinayi, an Italian economist and politician who chairs the European Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. She was previously an MP in the Italian Parliament and a Deputy Secretary of the Democratic Party. She joins me from Malaysia land today. Uh, Irene Tinay, thank you so much for being my guest on Talking Europe. Um, you said recently that the EU budget needs extra funds to deal with these crises that I mentioned, inflation, uh, decoupling from Russian gas and so forth. Uh, you're in favour of spending even more money when a lot of money has already been agreed? I'm in favor of uh, having a real strong European budget to support European infrastructures, to support European industry, uh, to support the single market in a time of great challenges. Uh, because right now, most of the investments that are needed are falling on the shoulders of the single member states. And this is not feasible. This is not uh, helping the real union to move forward. So it will increase divergences. It will have uh, impact on unequal growth inside the EU. And in the end, it will affect our competitiveness. So but I think we need to take uh, you know, this into account. Uh, but you admit that there is unused money from some of the current schemes, for example, the uh, recovery and resilience package, the, the post-COVID uh, 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 post funding uh, scheme. Uh, so, so why not use that kind of money first before trying to renegotiate a budget or something like that? Of course, that money has to be used uh, wisely, uh, fully, and, uh, but uh, don't uh, forget that most of that money it's still a loan. Uh, that's why not all the member states have decided to use all of it, because in the end, it's going to increase their debt. So um, this is something we have to think about. And also the problem with that kind of money is that the horizon, the time horizon is very short. So not uh, all the member states have the capacity to mm. absorb and invest that money in such a short time span, especially if we consider that since when we you know, uh, created the recovery fund, there was a war that broke in the Europe, you know, at the border of the European Union. There was an energy crisis, so some priorities changed. So this shortened the time and uh, created new priorities. So we have to really understand the difficult circumstances where in which the European Union and all the member states had to deal with during this uh, last year. Mm. Uh, on those difficult circumstances, I mentioned uh, banking issues uh, in my introduction. You're a proponent of finishing the bank or completing, I should say, the banking union. And that includes creating uh, a joint deposits, uh, an insurance for, for joint deposits. Again, that obviously runs into resistance from so-called frugal countries in the European Union. Of course, you know, there are resistances also because many member states already have their national schemes in terms of deposit insurance. The problem is that the banking system is very much interlinked. There is a lot of connection uh, and there are systemic risks that, uh, you know, uh, some crisis that happens in one country could spread out and we need to protect all European citizens and make sure that the European system is resilient. So we see, for example, the, uh, how fast uh, certain crises are dealt with in the United States where they have such an instrument. We don't have that instrument. We have created a banking union uh, where the surveillance is working well, and that's also why the banking system is still resilient. Um, the resolution framework, uh, we created the resolution fund, but we missed this 
third pillar, the deposit insurance scheme at the European level could really be important. And we have all the experts, uh, all the authorities uh, that come to the uh, parliament uh, in, the, in their public hearings and they say, please, complete the banking union. It's crucial for the European Union, uh, uh, you know, resilience and competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So we need to really start thinking in terms of European Union. Uh, you're uh, known as, as a critic of the uh, Italian Prime Minister, Giorgia Maloney. Of course, you're not from uh, the same political persuasion, to put it mildly. Um, recently, you've said that she uh, is falling behind in uh, investing the recovery fund uh, money uh, that's been agreed between Italy and the European Union and engaging in a, in a kind of populism, apparently suggesting that France and Germany want to oversee or surveil Italy and how it uses this money. That's a pretty uh, major allegation you're making that she's falling behind on, on investments. What, what's, what's the evidence of that? The evidence is actually in the declaration of the government itself. Uh, so um, the main ministers that are supervising the implementation of the uh, national resilience plans, they said that there are problems in uh, and issues in making sure that all the targets and milestones will be uh, completed in time. Uh, so there is a negotiation going on with the European Commission. Uh, I know that the uh, dialogue is, uh, is positive, is constructive, but I also know that we still don't know exactly what this government, the Italian government, wants to do in terms of changing the priority, because this is what the prime minister said, even during the electoral campaign. They campaigned saying that they wanted to change the national plan for the you know, recovery and resilience. Uh, but they never said exactly which projects they wanted to change, in favor of what. Mm -hmm. And now it's been months and months, and we still don't have the new plan. But time is uh, clocking, you know, the clock is, uh, <laughs> is moving, mm -hmm. and we don't have that much time. As I said, the time uh, horizon of this plan uh, is very short. We need to run. We need uh, to make sure that we spend all this money in the best possible way and in the fastest possible way. Uh I need to ask you about the Italian government's declaration of a six-month emergency in the light of migrant arrivals. So, according to the Interior Ministry of Italy, 31,000 migrants, more or less, have arrived this year, which is up 7,900 people on the same period for last year. Is declaring an emergency the right way forward? Frankly, I don't think so. We've always had this problem, and it's not, it's not a new problem. We've lived with this for decades. Uh, for sure, it is something that we need to act upon. It's something we need to push also the European institutions and the European Union. Uh, on this thing, I agree with our government. We need a more e commitment and involvement uh, of the other member states. Uh, I'm not sure that declaring the emergency, which basically uh, gives additional powers to address something that is not a one-shot emergency, is a structural problem that needs to have structural answers. I mean, I suppose the government would say it's doing this because it isn't receiving that solidarity for, from, from other, other EU member states. Uh, but, but how do you see the actual, how do you see this emergency actually being applied? Will it lead to, for example, uh, asylum claims being processed faster or not carefully enough? I mean, how, how do you see this actually playing out? I'm not sure. I can't mm. see anything. I mean, because they, they say they want to speed up process to create more centers for, you know, recognition. Mm. But uh, uh, as far as I know, there is no additional money to do that. So it's not clear how they are mm. going to use the powers. That's the issue. Mm. Yeah, you're in Milan, where there have been some protests uh, by LGBT activists who are saying that the government is uh, clamping down uh, on their rights. And this is uh, essentially about uh, 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 the ability for the city council to register uh, adopted children. Uh, what do you think about this whole situation? And are their rights actually being attacked or is everything that's being done in line with the 2016 law, which actually does not explicitly allow adoptions for same-sex couples? 
Uh, th there is a, a conflict with this uh, law that you mentioned, but there is also the need to recognize uh, uh, children, the need to guarantee certain rights, LGBT rights, uh, children's rights. Uh, I'm afraid that, uh, you know, we are not up to the speed to which society is changing and we need to respond to these changes. So um, I think this is a problem that will need to be addressed. So, so more legal clarity is needed on this whole issue perhaps? Absolutely, and the parliament should uh, act, the government should probably uh, try not to uh, you know, hold back these changes. It should uh, help regulating and uh, meeting the needs of this, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, it's 21st century society that uh, this is, uh, we can't look back. I mean, we need to protect citizens and children uh, in today's society, giving clarity and not holding that back. Okay, well, I think we should probably end on that note. Thank you so much, Irene Tinayi, my guest for part one of this program. And I'll be back after a short break with my panel of MEPs here in the European Parliament. So do stay with us. <laughs>